I appreciate your input. So last time we, were, we began our discussion of complementary feeding. And um, if you review the section, uh, the module on infants and toddlers and allergies, you will see that there's a couple of articles on how critical the first year of life is. And they actually, there's a term called the first thousand days where they look at, they, they track development from conception through age two. So the conception, of course, is gonna affect the uh, in utero time, gestation, and then after, um, after birth, the first two years of life have a huge impact on the entire health trajectory of children. And so this issue of complementary feeding, if, if, if you at present are not working with anybody or don't have a personal experience with feeding young children, I still hope you can understand that, that how critical this is because this will be an aspect of your life at some point, whether you experience it personally or help others. And it really matters what we do. And some the, the US practices, as you're gonna see in this lecture today, are way away from what the recommendations are. So we went over the slide last time, but I'm gonna talk about it again, just to kind of follow through. So complementary foods are the first foods and beverages. Uh, fed to infants along with breast milk or formula. And we provide healthful complementary foods because we need the children need the nutrients. They learn so much from the process, and we'll talk about this quite a bit, not only about how to eat, but about how to interact with parents and show their hunger and their needs. Um, and the dietary habits may track the child's life. So a high sugar diet may set the stage for a high sugar consumption throughout life or preference for sweetness. And the risk of obesity rapidly develops between ages one and 24 months. So this is a critical point of prevention. I think I mentioned this last time that if you can, if the child can <clears throat> make it to age five without experiencing overweight or obesity, they're much more likely to make it through their junior high and high school year, whatever you call it, or middle school and high school years um, and reach adulthood without experiencing overweight or obesity. It's not, a, it's not perfect, but it's a really good way to get started. So the, one of the reasons I've been so focused on this issue in lifespan nutrition is because up until two months ago, there were no guidelines provided by the United States government for feeding children between the ages zero and 24 months. We've had the dietary guidelines for Americans you know, produced every five years for a long period of time, but they've always just left out that age group. And so to fill the gap, there's been organizations that have provided guidelines, but they have, have not been official guidelines. So the lecture is based on current literature. Also, I reviewed the current dietary guidelines, which just now came out. And these, um, I look at current literature, scientific studies, as well as the, what these are, or key organizations say. So, the state of knowledge presented in this lecture is the best state of knowledge that we have in the United States now. So uh, 2020 Dietary Guidelines, again, it came out in uh, January. Um, uh, I changed the text here on your slide because I said will include, and I say now include, because they do, recommendations for ages 0 to 24 months. This was called the B24 Project during development and B standard and I'm really thinking that stood for, stands for birth, okay? So birth to 24 months is what this was about. So I tell you this because if you're looking at some of the scientific literature about feeding practices, you might see this language B to 24 because it was used for two or three years and when people were working on the documentation, they hoped the dietary guidelines would use when they could develop these uh, recommendations. So this is a, for people who work in the field of infant and toddler nutrition, this is an exciting time that there are finally guidelines. Uh, again, I mentioned that uh, the current lecture is based on uh, all the relevant information. Okay, so before I get into what and how, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on in the United States now. We did not have a good feel for intake of foods and nutrients in this age group at all until I think it was 2002. Um, that may seem like a lifetime ago to you, but for people that study this, there was basically no information on what infants and toddlers were consuming. 
So in 2002, and then again in 2008, and I believe again later 2012, um, some researchers started asking parents using 24-hour recalls and other methodologies, what did you feed your kid? Yesterday, we did 24-hour recall. What did your kid eat yesterday? And they, they typically couldn't look at volume, but they looked at exposures. Did they have any broccoli? Did they have any fruit? Did they have any dairy? You know, did they have any high, high sodium items? And so, so I saw a comment on the, the remarkably beautiful children included here. And this is actually the same person as my first grandson. And this is Miss Thornton's uh, first baby, uh, Hannah. She's quite a bit older now. She's five or six. Okay. Um, so let's talk about, remember this is what's going, what, what, what are current practices. So I'm kind of in this lecture, I review what the guideline is and then what people are actually doing. So cow milk, the guideline is not to consume it as a beverage before age one. Do you remember why this should not be a, an important beverage for kids under the age of one? Because, because it breast milk or formula. Because what? It will displace breast milk or formula. And why do we care? Because it doesn't have as many nutrients or benefits the child. Absolutely true. And there's one nutrient in particular that cow milk can interfere with. Do you remember what that is? Anybody? Is it iron? Yeah. Yeah. If you start uh, cow milk consumption early when people, especially if they don't know any better or if, if, you know, if, if income is an issue because of hormones is expensive, they may be tempted to start, especially if they have older kids, start the, the infant on, on cow milk before the age of one. And as you indicated, that's totally inappropriate, but in particular because it can interfere with iron status. Cow milk is a known uh, in, uh, interferer with um, iron status. So what's in this actual practice means, what are people doing, you know, in the United States, these studies I talked about? Well, in four to six months, people aren't giving cow milk, but as you can see in the nine to 12 months range, cow milk as a beverage replacing breast milk and formula or as an important beverage has been included. What this means is this is an important point of education. If you're working with uh, individuals, uh, this would be a good thing to teach them about and why. That's why I focus on this because we'll talk about it a little bit later in, in a slide on iron, but remember how important iron is for cognitive development and many other things. Okay, so the age of introduction matters too. The guideline is around six months of age. I, don't, I can't remember if I've talked about this much. Does anybody have a reason why we want to offer food around six months? Is there just not enough supplementation from um, from mother's milk and uh, formula that we need, you know, supplementation from outside foods? That is absolutely one of the ma major reasons. Breast is milk, it? you know, breast milk has this health halo, which is appropriate because it's so helpful. But at six months, it's no longer adequate. And as you indicate, Joel, neither is formula. It's no, they're no longer adequate. So around the six months, and We'll talk more about why it matters at the age of introduction. And one more thing I'll bring up here is if we wait, like two, okay, so too early, and I haven't talked about this yet, but I'll tell you now. So too early, such as before four months, can increase the risk for obesity. Kids are not ready for foods before four months. And there's studies that show that, that offering food too early can increase risk for childhood obesity. And then if you wait too long, after six months, seven months, eight months, what happens there is the infants are missing an opportunity to learn how to interact with food. So complementary feeding is important for psychological, nutritional, and uh, uh, motor development. And so there's many reasons involved in this. And I, I had firsthand experience of this in a many years ago when I was doing my dietetic and internship in Central Arkansas. And there was a child that was hospitalized and she was probably in her eighth or ninth month. And she was in a crib in the hospital. She'd been there a long time. She was standing up. And I remember she had a very large tongue. That was one of her problems, which sometimes is associated with Down syndrome too. And because it was so big, she had not been able to eat when she was younger. 
And so they skipped the period, and I, maybe she's a little older than nine months, plus you're 11, I think. But because they had, had had to skip this opportunity, she didn't want like food. She didn't want it in her mouth. It didn't feel good to her. It was not, you know, she hadn't developed that um, relationship that we all have with food now. You think about, well, I really want to eat. I like sweets. What's for dinner? You know, where we, we crave certain things. She did not associate pleasure with food in her mouth. So this is a training opportunity that was missed. So waiting too long can interfere with nutrition and also with a necessary learning opportunity. So let's look at what's going on in actual practice. Uh, before four months, about 40% of infants are fed solid foods. Okay, so obviously, this is a good point for education. So who does this? And, and you know, we, we talk about, I get these facts, and we've been talking about research, and I want you to understand that every line in here is based on my reading of the literature. And so when I say who does this, it comes from uh, research that indicates demographic characteristics of people that are more likely to feed foods earlier, okay? And there, there are characteristics and also there are focus group studies that ask people, when did you start? Why did you start? What were your motivations? It comes from the literature, it's not just opinion. Okay, so who does this? Um, it's more likely for parents who feed infants formula to offer foods early, and this may just because they're used to giving something to the infant that they prepare, there may, that may be removed that barrier. And also mothers um, with less education who are single or young, younger than 25 years of age, this is a demographic characteristic where they may offer foods earlier. So that's just characteristics. Why? So many cite advice from healthcare professionals, and this drives me completely nuts because I have heard it firsthand from some of my very educated colleagues who've had kids recently. Their, their pediatrician will say, they're old enough for Cheerios now when they're four months old. You know, Cheerios, for one thing, don't get me started. It's a processed food, right? I mean, you may think of it as pretty good. It's better than Captain Crunch, but it's certainly not a good food for first food for an infant when you're looking at, 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 at needs for you know, taste preferences and, and learning to eat foods and, and to get uh, high nutrition. So healthcare professionals need education too. And that can be an important part of our mission as uh, dietitians and nutrition educators to make sure that people that don't focus on this know better. And also uh, some people, and th this is really important. Um, people think they're old enough at four months. They feel like the infants are hungry and they pray mightily that it will help them sleep longer. So because of sleep issues, so many parents are interested in providing, you know, adding cereal to the bottle, which is a no-no because it can be choking, a choking hazard and it doesn't work and it's too early and may increase risk for obesity. But, but around, it, having an infant is difficult. They wake up. Um, they wake up too much. Some people are really stressed. Some people are lucky. They either have a good sleeper or they, there's some classes that can help people learn how to help their kids sleep better. But many people just don't have this in their, the first few months of life are really hard on parents. So they may just make a, you know, I'm going to go ahead and put syrup on the bottom and feed them anything to make them sleep. Okay, so let's look at sweets, vegetables, and sodium. Um, sweets, well, I have calories here too. The guideline is not before age two. Why would that be? They can develop a taste for it? Yeah. I mean, we actually have an inherent taste preference for sweet. And the thought is this comes from uh, you know, fruits are high, that are high in vitamin C are sweet and we need vitamin C. So um, fruits are tasty for us. And so the, the thought is that's why we have a sweet tooth. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> manufacturers have been able to make foods that are a whole lot tastier than fresh fruit to some people. They're intensely sweet or intensely, you know how desserts are, right? Brownies and so forth. So, so the reason is taste preferences and also risk for obesity and associated cardiovascular issues. 
So the American Heart Association, which I'll, I have on a future slide, recommends nothing before the age of two, no sugar. So let's look and see what's going on. And this is, these are daily habits. And as you can see, sugar consumption is pretty common. All right, and, and all, all of these things are associated with uh, obesity. Uh, when kids get older, and, and I think what's hard is if you have several children or two or three, the first one, you, if you know and you're educated and you have it, can handle this, you can prevent the sugar. But then when they get older and they start eating sweet sometimes, because families often offer desserts. So then you have an infant coming down the pipe and people may not practice so much care because they have several infants in the house and it's difficult. So th this is an important uh, point of education and most people offer sweets. So vegetables, um, the guideline is daily with variety. Why? You can make it up. So they don't get tired of eating the same thing. And they learn to like more foods. The more you provide, the more they like. Um, let me bring this up now and I'll bring it up again, but you can offer an infant whatever the first vegetable is, broccoli or carrots or something, and they will often make a face. I don't like this. And, and parents sometimes go, oh, well, they don't like this. Even my daughter and, and her husband, who know all of the stuff that's and they have me, you know, when I showed up, they'll still say, well, my daughter doesn't like X. And I'm like, how many times have you given it to her? And they're like, yeah, 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 but she doesn't like it. It's really easy. And parents oftentimes will, it's easy to assume that and parents will feed a baby and I'll show you a picture in a minute and they'll make a face and they go, ah, they don't like it. So parents interpret that face as they don't like this food and then sometimes stop giving it to them. What we need to do is provide it over and over again, model it, consume it. You know, the ideal thing is if you have broccoli for dinner, you make the broccoli, you steam it, you take some aside, stick it in the baby blender. You know, you have, there's some real cheap blenders you can just have and you give them purees when they're little and then softer uh, cooked broccoli when they're old enough to feed themselves. And then you add seasoning to yours, right? So it's, if parents have the capacity to do this, it's a, it's a good way to do it. So we need variety. And the reason they need, they need vegetables for nutrition, and this sounds, this may sound counterintuitive, but, or not counterintuitive, but obvious, but over the years, one of my philosophies that's developed about nutrition is that we need to eat fruits and vegetables so we're not eating the American diet. We need to fill up on, you know, beans and, and fruits and vegetables and salads and things like that because we know they benefit us because of the nutrients, but also we have to eat something. We've got to fill our stomach with something. And if we don't eat those um, filling foods and then simply eat the yummy stuff like pizza, we eat too much of it, right? We eat too much. So if you have pizza for dinner, which is fine. In fact, I can make a really nice holy crust pizza, but that's beside the point. You know, pizza for dinner, but if you limit it to your portion and then also have a big salad with it, then what you're doing is you're, you're, you're getting full on whole foods along with your yummy stuff. There's strategies to make, make this work. But you know, kids will often, and it's very hard for parents, they'll often develop this situation where they won't eat anything unless it's yummy. So if they've had macaroni and cheese, salty macaroni and cheese, all this kind of stuff, they'll hold out. And so it's real important that they get this exposure to produce where it's part of their norm. And it's easier said than done sometimes. So the guideline on energy is, depends on the kid. That's why I have question marks. They shouldn't eat more than they need, but I will tell you that most kids exceed their energy requirements. Not all of them, but most of them do. I have a yeah. Wait, as you've been talking, it just kind of struck me. So my, my daughter now, she's, you know, eating, she's on baby food. And I just realized that now, nowadays, like all the baby foods that are, quote unquote vegetables, they have a fruit, like a sweet fruit thrown into the mix in like every single one of them. So every single vegetable that she's eating is, has got like a sweet taste to it. And this, I don't remember that being the case with my first one because she's, mm -hmm. she's 10. And back in the day, like they had 
bitter vegetable choices. And she actually loves vegetables. Like my daughter, she has no problem eating vegetables. So I'm like, oh crap, <laughs> maybe I should be a little bit more careful about the vegetables that I'm choosing to feed them because yeah, I'm, I feel like now we should, I should be worried that uh, she's not gonna have a taste for vegetables now because of the fruits that they've been adding to the, the baby foods. That's, I, I love your comments because you're in the trenches, right? And so when you're in the trenches, you just know more than everybody else. And also I think these products are oftentimes manufactured for parents. And so, and I've seen those too. Um, and you know, there's also the squeeze pouches, right? And the squeeze pouches are always, they sound so good, right? Pear and kale and lentils or something like that. But they're sweet, just like you said. So they, and the kids love them. It's really fun to suck down a pouch, right? It's all sweet. It's like a smoothie sort of. Um, perfect, perfect choice. And, and, and you can get single item baby foods, but you have to look for it, right? And so that's such a good point. It's one of our problems. And it's, I feel like, I, I feel very compassionate for parents and I don't wanna, I don't like to use the word should and sound pejorative and all stuff because people are, you know, without sleep and dealing with baby and dealing with COVID and working, it, it's almost too much, but to the extent possible, if you can figure out a way to, you know, parents can figure out a way to set aside the fruit that they're, the vegetables that they're eating anyway, that's the perfect choice. But they need education and time, you know, and not everybody gets that. There's also some things that I don't think I'd go into this later, but there's tools that parents can use. If you have, you, know, you don't have to spend $80 on a baby food blender. You can just buy a, a little chopper for $30, $30 or something you keep in the kitchen all the time. And you can blap something out. And if you make more than the baby can eat, you can use these uh, silicone ice trays and put serving, like fill the tray up and freeze it. And once the, stuff, the portions are frozen, then you can empty them out into a, a, a container in the freezer. Then when it's time for dinner, you can pop out something that you've already made, right? And so, so there's there's solutions to this, but again, um, single parenting is a bit there, COVID is a bit uh, there's some barriers. So, but. okay, uh, sodium. This is the 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 guideline is no more than the, the DRI, and I'll talk about this. But the problem is, is American food is so high in sodium and it is everywhere. And if you provide processed foods for kids, they're gonna to have too much. And so let me ask you, when I say processed foods, what do you think of? Give me an example and then why you consider that to be processed. I think of deli meat and snack food like chips. Um, and I'm trying to think, of, I mean, I don't know how to explain the reasoning. I just know that they're processed. What? Um, we're talking about sodium. So would you call those items high in sodium? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's one characteristic of processed foods pretty much across the board. And, you know, we had sodium at home, but studies show that adding salt at home is not how we consume too much salt where it comes from is from processed purchased foods. Perfect example. You know, what I like to think about is how far away from a real food is this item? Okay, so for an example, we all use processed foods, right? We do it for everything. You know, I, I make lots of whole foods and then I make my own salad dressings and in my own salad dressings, I make a balsamic vinaigrette and that is balsamic vinegar which is, comes in a bottle, a Dijon mustard, which is a processed food with some salt in it. Um, it's, this is really good though. <laughs> um, uh, some salt and olive oil. Well, olive oil in theory is a processed food because it's not straight olives, right? So we all use processed foods. Some of this are just barely processed, but they make cooking convenient. And I'm all for those things. If I didn't use olive oil to prepare my sauteed vegetables or roasted vegetables, they wouldn't taste good. So some processing is good. There, there's actually some, some terminology around this that goes from processed to ultra processed. So processed food refers to anything that has any processing post-production, such as olive oil. But ultra processed food, chips are a perfect example. 
you could look at a chip and if you didn't understand the food system, you wouldn't even know what that was. You have no idea that that actually came from a potato or from corn, right? You just, you can't tell. It's just yummy and crunchy. And I, sadly, I get hungry talking about this. But, but so, so, so what we want to try to do is think about foods this way. Minimally processed is better. Ultra processed is going to be high in salt. And one of the more common processed foods for kids, you know, uh, macaroni and cheese is on almost every child menu in any restaurant. And it's so common. And that's because anybody in their right mind would eat that because it's tasty and yummy. Any more comments about this? Because I, I really, I, I want you to try to think about processed foods in this way. How, how ultra processed is it? That in that by not just salt, but also um, the other ingredients like chips, for example, corn chip. How far away is that from corn? You know, corn has a bad reputation, at least around pale people. But you can actually eat some corn and it's fine. But then you, when they process it and so forth, then it's the moisture is removed. You know, oftentimes the fibers are removed and it's fried, deep fried, and salted, and so it's very processed. And any comments about this or thoughts? For those um, like like those chicken tenders that are like meat alternatives, like I know those are very processed. Are those also really high in sodium? Like you know those there's like those veggie chicken tenders and there's like the fishless fillet sticks. I'm so glad you brought this up. Yeah, I eat mostly a vegetarian diet and um, with fish, right? So um, I look at those things all the time, meat alternatives. And they're really good, right? Veggie, veggie burger, you can make a veggie burger, get all the sensory, for me, because I don't have, I haven't had meat in, in decades, but it hits all the sensory needs because you can put mustard and ketchup and, you know, tomatoes and lettuce and middle of cheese. It's really good. But if you look at the actual product, it's pretty high in salt. And it, 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 you know, so you're right. Now, is it better for you than beef? That's a billion dollar question, which I'm actually not, not going to get into too much because we have to look at so many things we can talk about, but you get into the impact on the environment and then also the impact on health. Well, if you eat a hamburger once a month, a beef hamburger is fine. It's not going to change your life. If you eat beef several times a week, then that will change your life. And there is increased risk for colon cancer and things like that from the high meat diet, right? So, so moderation, honestly, except for whole foods, moderation in all things. And I don't consider those products, the fake meat products to be moderate. Or, uh, I, I consider them to be processed. I'm sorry, I use one. I don't consider them to be. I don't. I do consider them to be processed. Now I have one um, exception to this. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had tempeh before. It's one of my favorite things. It's a nice solution to wanting something savory and meaty that's not meat and that's not highly processed. It still is because tempeh is made. It's a fermented product where they take soybeans and sort of ferment them for a while so they kind of link together and so it, it, they come out a little a little mat right a little package you can take that and slice it up and stir fry it with olive oil and a moderate amount of soy sauce and stuff like that and make something really tasty you can control how much salt's in it and it's those that's among our favorite snack items of Thai and protein so there's ways to get around this but, you know, honestly, I didn't really get good at this until COVID because I don't have anything else to do for the past 11 months to get better at cooking, you know? And so, so there's always those options, but I, I love your comment about the general products. The, the, the general products can be too high in salt. So very, very good comment. I have like a quick literal answer. So these oh. are... <laughs> I just grabbed them from my freezer. Um, but for two tenders, which they're pretty small, um, there's 230 milligrams of sodium. So for two of these. So just a quick literal answer. That's perfect. Thank you. I should go get my Boca burgers out because I have two in the freezer. <laughs> but we have them for treats. They're not regular because of the salt. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about the nutrient requirements. I wanted to go over what kids eat and the guidelines a little bit to kind of frame everything. And so I, I have this little sort of cartoon here to think about. Um, first baby, given the income and support and so forth, and they come as from scratch because they worry about the salt or store-bought. And so 
it's easier the first time around. And sometimes when the kids pile on, it becomes harder for families, especially if they're working or if you only have a single parent, it's harder. So here's a second baby. Now, this, in my defense, this is my son who's now 31. He was at McDonald's. That is a French fry in his mouth, but I'm going to claim purity because it's the only time he wrote to McDonald's as a child. We were on a, we were on a trip to drive a car trip to West Virginia or something. And so, you know, but uh, shut him up. Right? He was completely happy with that. So, and anyway, a second baby, sometimes we're like, you know, here. Okay, so these have to do with the daily requirements uh, for energy and protein. So, and I, there's so many numbers here. I can see, I can anticipate that you may be thinking, what do we have to know? And I'm not going to have you have to know all these numbers because it's too much. But let me, I've highlighted things I really want you to focus on. Um, so we've already talked about calories and indicated that calories per kilogram go down between four to six months and zero to 12 because the kids are growing, right? They're, they're growing more slowly. And for toddlers, I highlight that one too. Because I want to make a point here. So 1,000 to 1,400 calories. In studies that I have done in San Marcos, I have recorded some toddlers consuming 2,200 calories a day. And it just gets away from people sometimes. And I will also say, as, as a, an older woman who's you know, had to manage weight management and teaching and thinking about the literature and trying to give good advice to people over many years, um, for women my age, if you're not active, and I'm a little tall, so I have a little latitude. But for women my age, I'm 64 and counting. Oftentimes, 1,200 calories a day is, not, uh, is needed to maintain body weight. Try eating them. See how that goes. I exercise a lot because I, 1,200 calories a day makes me want to just lie down and die. This is not enough food. But for perspective, toddlers, they don't need the, they, they need this calorie, they need these calories for growth. They don't need more than this. They don't need enough for adult men and women. And, and sometimes I've seen it, 2,200 calories a day is close to what a college age women need. Okay, it's in the ballpark. So, you know, and, and, and how this happens, how do kids end up eating so many calories? One way is through savory foods. Now I'm going to keep picking on mac and cheese because I see it so much, but savory foods make you eat more, right? If it's salty and sweet, you know, salty or sweet and yummy and fatty, we like it. And it's really hard to stop as soon as you're full. And you, it doesn't, because those are high calorie concentrated calories too, we don't actually feel volume full for, for too early on. So, so toddlers can easily eat too much if they're eating processed foods. If they're eating fruits and vegetables, is a bigger part of the diet, it's easier for those calories to get diluted. And with respect to protein, I'm very interested in these numbers here because they're so low. Do y'all remember how much, okay, one, year, one to three years old, let, let's do this, one to three year old kids, um, they could drink cow milk, right? Starting at age one. So how many grams of protein in a cup of cow milk? Isn't it like eight? Yep. How much in an egg? Six. Yeah, six or seven. Yep, that's right. Are we topped out yet? And uh, so it's very easy to get enough protein and it's very easy to exceed this. And studies show that high pro excess protein intake can increase with obesity. And um, I've published on this. Um, so what happens is parents, one, one thought, one theory is that parents have this health halo about protein intake because they may be in the paleo diet or they read magazines and whatever they know, they know that protein may help fill them up, help them 
they feel that may help them uh, not consume too many calories. So they feel like, well, let me offer my child good protein. And I, I think I've told you guys, if I haven't, I'm sorry, but uh, I've taught this for a long time. I don't always remember who I tell what to, but I've looked at many Facebook groups over the years to see what parents say and what they, what they justify and how they think about feeding because I wanna understand it. And people feel that, well, my child doesn't eat much, but at least I got good protein into them. And so parents may feel better if the kid eats a scrambled egg or some even Greek yogurt or you know an egg. And so they feel like they're being successful in getting that protein into them, which is true, but they don't need as much as people think they do. They really need the produce. You know, and the protein food in, I, in a perfect world would be things like salmon and so forth, but also provide other, other essential nutrients. Their eggs are good. Eggs are good. All those foods are good, but just get into excess sometimes. So they don't need, and, and in my studies in San Marcos, I have seen kids eating between 45 and 65 grams of protein a day, little kids. And there seems to be a correlation with that and, and the excess weight gain. Now, I apologize for always focusing on weight gain, but I have to because our national problem with health uh, with respect to children and adults revolves around excess weight. That's the biggest, biggest problem we have. And there's other problems too. There's eating disorders and malnutrition of other sorts, but, but obesity, unfortunately, keeps showing up because, because it's a problem. And, and you know, perfect example is individuals in the United States right now have comorbidities are more likely to die from COVID. 19, right? And what are those comorbidities? They revolve around excess weight and diabetes and hypertension and other uh, chronic conditions associated with weight. So it says, I don't like to focus on weight as a, in any kind of negative way or to be pejorative or anything like that, but we do need to keep it on the radar because it can be a predictor of long-term health. Any comments about this? I'm very open to your thoughts. I have some thoughts. Um, I've worked in like a grocery store. And so I see a lot of parents shopping for their kids and I can hear them talking out loud to themselves about, you know, there's kids protein bars. So they think, oh yeah, you know, like protein's good for adults. Why wouldn't it be good for kids? And it's marketed and created for kids or the like veggie chips. That's like a big one now is like, everyone's like, well, you can't have the potato chips. You can have the veggie chips. And it's just like, I sit there and I think I'm like, no one's looking at the back. Like you, you read that it has a third of a quart a serving for your daily intake. But I mean, what is that? You know, it's just, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just commenting on the marketing that parents are under. Marketing is so critical. Anybody else? I want to talk about it, but I want to open it if anybody else wants to talk about marketing because it's so critical. Marketing is so frustrating because when you have family members who don't understand like nutrition and they try to talk to you about, oh, this says that, you know, it has this many, you know, it has vitamin C and it has calcium and all this stuff. It's like, yeah, but how much fat does it have? Like how much salt does it have? you know, and uh, if you know so many people around you, just like in your inner circle that are ignorant on those types of things, like imagine how many people in the world are, how many people in the society are, so. Such a good comment, and, and, and I like this so much because I want to, I want to contrast our, our society to, to societies that actually have legislation and policies that may restrict marketing to kids. And, you know, regardless of your politics or, or whatever, um, there are countries that do restrict, they have democracy, they have, they, they support capitalism, they support, you know, free society and capitalism, ways to make money, all this kind of stuff, but they still regulate things like marketing kids. In the United States, we don't we, we have we don't have regulation about this. Um, our regulations are pro industry, no matter what. And to get any kind of packaging that educates the parents against particular foods is almost impossible to do. We only ask corporations, we ask them to voluntarily change their formulas 
and voluntarily, you know, try to do a better job. And so the problem is kids are marketed to from, I mean, actually, this is an onion joke from a long time ago. It was about toothpaste being marketed to pregnant women um, because they're trying to think about the little tiny cells that's going to turn into a tooth in a year or right? <laughs> something like that. So they started so soon. And so we just, we, we know calcium's good, we know vitamins D good, we know things are good, we know fiber's good. And we'll use those for marketing when that's not the issue with the food, is the fact that it's high in calories and, and so forth. And your example of veggie chips is a, is a perfect example, of just as bad as corn chips. And, and they use the word vegetable and it sounds good. There should be a, in my opinion, an asterisk that says no vegetables are actually used. Or, or one teaspoon of vegetable per box or something like that. Anybody else? I just um, have one thing to say. Um, I get the marketing um, to, to parents and stuff like that. But I guess one issue I have is uh, when I worked with low-income families in Philadelphia, a lot of them didn't even know how to read a food label, like period. Okay. Thank you. So that is that is such a big issue too. What that's called, there's a term called health literacy, which has to do with the capacity of liter, liter, literacy capacity to read a food label or a medicine label, including a prescription label. How much, or, you know, or the little bottles of Tylenol or whatever that, that, that families get, to be able to read that, translate that into appropriate practice and so forth. So it's called health literacy, and um, it's it's easy for people that don't have the kind of education you're getting to not know the difference. In fact, many people whose field are isn't related to health don't know what to do with food labels. And you're right. So parents don't. Know. So yeah. if, we, if we required. Honestly, Sorry. Cool. So what I was saying with that was this kind of like they rely on marketing like, oh, it's high in vitamin C. Oh, this says it's 100% juice or all natural. And it may not be, you know, <laughs> so I guess that's where I was going with that. No, yeah, no, this has been going on for a long time. Let me give an example that we used to give in classes. Um, vegetable oils used to be, people would say, no, it's peanut butter too and vegetable oils say contains no cholesterol that would be the marketing tool because people associated with cholesterol dietary intake which we don't know, with cardiovascular disease so the fact that peanut butter has no cholesterol is stupid because it peanuts don't you know livers are involved in making cholesterol so you're so but they would use those marketing ploys just like you say to to uh solicit purchases by people that think, oh, that sounds good. Perfect. I agree. I was actually going to say that, um, to talk about that too a little bit, that I didn't learn how to read a nutrition label until I was in my late 20s. And this was after I had been, I'd gone through like a lifestyle change where I was actually really healthy and trying to improve myself. And even then it took me years to learn how to um, read a nutrition label. And it's like, we always talk about like, you know, what should they be teaching in schools? They should be teaching financial literacy. And this is like something new to me is that I really feel like we should be teaching nutri like health literacy in schools because that could solve so many problems. It'd be, so we're not like reactive, like going to corporations and asking them to change their marketing instead of just going to the source, which is teaching kids who are going to eventually grow up to be parents, how to be healthy and how to be able to read nutrition labels. Yeah, you know, you're right. And especially because if parents knew what to do, then they would purchase more healthy items. And so there would be less of a market for the crap that is sold across the nation. There'd be less of a market for it when people would go and, you know, and, and simplistically, we can teach, I teach this all the time, simplistically, it's about processed food. And if you could teach that one thing, honestly, the, the, the closer it is to something that grew, grows on the planet, the, the better it is. But that takes, it takes education to believe that. And then also, if it's a package, such as something like rice, right? You could, in an example, I could, you could buy a, a package of uh, even brown and wild rice. Let's say you know those are whole foods. 
that can still have salt added to it. So you would have to know how to read a label, why sodium matters, and, and then know that it's more of a whole food. So uh, we, I, I love the idea of educating kids about it. And I honestly, uh, I think people would really appreciate it. Over the years, I've taught this for, taught students for 30 years about this. And every student whose parents have taught them and had restrictions on unhealthy food is grateful. I've never had a kid that said, gee, I wish my parents had, had let me drink more Coke. <laughs> you know, so, so kids would appreciate that too. So thank you for this conversation, you guys. It's very helpful. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, Mary Nestle's What to Eat book. It's a little bit outdated, but it's really good. It talks about like marketing procedures within the supermarket. It's really, really good. You can get it on Amazon for like six bucks maybe. Yes, and also she has a Facebook, or not Facebook, but a website, Mary Nestle, Nestle and her name is Nestle, you know, it just smells like Nestle, but, but we have it in our food systems class, so at least we used to go and, and look at her website. I agree with that. Also, and this is funny because she has a professional, but Michael Pollan, who's not educated in nutrition, has some books, you know, eat, what's his advice is eat, you know, eat mostly plants, but not too, you know, <laughs> not too much. It's very simple, but those are good books, especially for lay people to, to recommend. They're fantastic. The philosophy is the same. And studying this for 30 years or 35 years, there's been no literature that says, let's go for more processed foods and, and that's a problem. It's always, let's go back to basics, back to our, you know, 100 years ago where your parents said eat your vegetables. So it still comes up. We're just faced with so many. So we're marketed to by so many options now and they can have such a big effect on, on what parents do and they're in a hurry and fast food is cheap you know mcdonald's and places like that um you know don't have to really pay a living wage for people that work there so they can sell food cheap and the, the cheap food is is uh, subsidized oftentimes by the government corn and beef is subsidized and high in salt and uses a lot of water resources and so forth. So we have a system right now that promotes fast food environment uh, to the detriment. You know, I forget the, the recent numbers on uh, going back to overweight and adults, it's around 67% of adults are overweight or obese and children, it's, it's a third, right? And so everybody's, everybody's health is impacted by this thing. Great conversation, you guys, thank you. So I'm gonna, I told you, I'm gonna beat iron to death over and over again. So here we are beating iron to death. Um, I mentioned this earlier too, and I highlighted what I really want your take home message here. The iron requirement for zero to six months is low because they have stores. So uh, if they're born term, if they're preterm, they may not have very good stores, but if they're born in term and mom wasn't anemic, they've got iron stores to last them between four and six months. Sometimes for exclusively breastfed infants, the stores may deplete and it's not a bad idea to give iron drops. But it's critical, this part really is critical to add iron rich complementary foods. So you don't start out with the rooftop house. So you don't start out with the garbage, you start out with the wheat. And then notice it, seven to 12 months, all of a sudden this requirement shoots up. And this is because around this time they're depleting their stores. And without these practices, iron deficiency anemia can happen. And it doesn't really show up. They don't test until 12 months. They really, they, they don't test unless a kid has behavioral issues until 12 months and by that time, if they've got iron deficiency anemia, they have already lost, potentially lost cognitive function. So I think this is one of the biggest, I, I read all the literature on this and I, I read the rationale behind public policy, but it would be nice if people know a little more about preventing iron deficiency anemia in the early years. Um, and so toddlers, uh, older, they, the, the DRI goes down because these are the critical months and they're not growing as fast here. This is a period of re zero to one years, really fast growth. There's enough iron here, but later on, um, there's enough iron here is because they have their stores, but as they get bigger, 
the stores aren't going to take care of it and they need to consume more. Now, for nutrition majors, we can talk about milligrams per day, and we have to do this because you guys are the experts. When you translate this to parents, what do you tell them to eat? So we want to have, for you, I want you to know both things because you're the experts. And I, I think in working clinically or working in the community, if you have your numbers down, you can tell people what I'm telling you now. Here's what happens. They have their stores. They don't need very much. And then all of a sudden, they need a lot. This is why I want you to know these numbers so that you are a more effective communicator to parents. And when they may not like numbers, but when they hear them, they bold, they're more likely to believe you. So your credibility is there. So it's one, it is improved. So this is one of the reasons I have the medicines. So this is such a critical period of time in children. If they're not getting the helpful foods they need, then this can matter a lot. So now I have these beautiful foods coming up, which we're already on your side, right? So this is, this doesn't, notice this doesn't have uh, uh, pears in it, okay? At least they made a product that is just beef and beef broth. Now I told you at the beginning that, that I'm a vegetarian or a pescatarian, but I also support animal product, animal flesh products for the first year of life because the risk, they don't have to have it, but if mom's a vegetarian or a vegan and her own stores are low, then her risk for having a kid that deals with anemia is greater. So I, I feel like being more inclusive about food recommendations this first year, and I probably already told you this, but I, my, my daughter has fed her kids, my daughter's a vegetarian, has fed her three kids, animal products. Now, we, my son hunts, and so she typically takes deer meat and makes that into you know, a product and, and then, you know, and then they consume that. But I'm so worried about our deficiency anemia that um, we want to make sure it's, so anyway, here's some options. Um, sometimes parents think salmon, that's an inappropriate food for kids. You should see them eat it. Salmon's probably the most accepted fish and a lot of kids really like it. And, and you know, it's, uh, it can be pretty inexpensive and it also provides your omega-3 fat. So it's, it's a nice choice. Also, literature strongly supports fortified cereals. So typically these cereals are fortified with iron and they should also have zinc, most of them do. And the fortified cereal, if, you, if parents don't want to consume meat products or offer their child meat products, this can work. Literature shows that if they are religious about doing this and have it on a daily basis, then that can help with iron status. So it's, it can be important. And then of course there's these other sources of iron that are beneficial as well. Why do we care? Iron deficiency anemia. The bottom line here is the consequences is permanent cognitive impairment if they become anemic. So let's go back. How many kids are anemic? Not that many, but there's still a lot of people. Okay, so 7% of toddlers are deficient and 2% are have full-blown anemia. And across the nation, we talked about health disparities before, but children who live in poverty and inner city or city housing that may have lead contamination, may have other challenges, they're more likely to experience iron deficiency anemia and the effects follow them their entire life. So, you know, I, I can be on an elite high horse about being a vegetarian but I don't, when, when we're talking to populations that can't spend whatever they want on food, we need to figure out what they can afford, what works for their families, and what can help prevent iron deficiency anemia with the kids. So that's why I'm so, I want to be very inclusive about recommendations for iron consumption so we meet the needs of the population. They can figure out diet later, but they don't. We, we want to avoid iron deficiency anemia if we can. The, the ramifications are serious. There's been some studies outside the United States, like in countries in, in, in Africa, for example, where people have recorded a 10 to 15 point IQ difference in kids based on their diet for two years, the first two years. Okay, so we've talked about risk here. I want to bring it up again. Excess milk. 
when you walk away from this class, if I see you on the street, you know, if you recognize me, but five years later, um, <laughs> if I ask you a question, what's the most important, one of the most important nutrients for children and what do you need to worry about? I want you to be able to talk about this. Not too much cow milk, limit cow milk. Don't eat a low iron diet and, and, and in cases of food insecurity and poverty, make sure that people have this information that they need. So the prevention, you, you must know this. I may ask it on every test from now on, including the final. So please know this and know why. We talked about the rationale last time. So I really want you to focus on this. Milk consumption is a problem. Remember cow milk can early on, younger than age one, you remember we talked about this. Cow milk is inappropriate because it displaces breast milk or formula. It's low in iron itself and it can cause gastrointestinal bleeding. So there's three reasons we've talked about before for younger kids. And here, older kids, some kids get into a milk habit and it may be if they were bottle fed then they enjoy the bottle experience and parents will give them milk in the bottle, which is not recommended. You wanna start cups at age one, but a lot of people don't. So if they're getting milk in the bottle, you know, then they may wanna consume more than two cups a day and it may comfort them. Parents may, you know, they're it's easier to put them down if I give them a bottle of warm milk when he goes to bed and so on and so on. So it's just something to, to keep in mind. In the case of they tested 12 months, if a child is anemic, then we should continually, continually test. If a child is anemic, they do need iron drops. This is not the time to go, I don't believe in medication, all natural is good. This is the time to address this emergency. So iron medication, help with the counseling, repeat screening. Any comments about this? Have I beat it to death enough? I guess is my question. You could just say yes. You want me to talk about iron some more or not? Kristen, what do you think? They want me to keep talking about iron, don't they? Can't tell. I think, no. I think we got the point. Pardon me? I think we got the point. Thank you. So I'm asking. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. So moving on to vitamin D. Remember, we talk about key nutrients at each stage of life. Um, so iron is a key nutrient, vitamin D is also one. We've talked about it before. This is to reinforce what we've talked about. Infants, remember breast milk does not contain adequate amounts of vitamin D. Uh, formula does. So formula fed kids just calm down. They're getting their vitamin D in their formula. If they're breastfed infants, then they need to consume 400 IU. Mom can either, if she's breastfeeding, she can put the drop on a nipple, or if it's in a bottle, she can put it in a bottle, if it's best enough in a bottle, or she can give them droppers, or mom can opt to take high doses of vitamin D, 6,400 IU per day. I always ask this on a test. I like you to understand what's required for vitamin D status, so please expect one or more questions about this. And after age one, cow milk can start to provide some vitamin D. Remember, moderation is important and requirements go up for toddlers, but look at these other food sources. They're not many, quite frankly. Um, vi vitamin D deficiency can be a problem because if, if you live in, in climates where you're exposed to the sun and it's the more direct sunlight like Texas, you produce vitamin D in your skin, right? From a precursor. So you actually we produce our own vitamin D in the summer. I'm not doing it right now because it's cold outside, right? So. No exposure to sunlight today, but uh, in country and in cities and states like Boston, cities like Boston and states like Massachusetts, they can't make enough vitamin D from sun exposure because the, the in the winter the angle of the sun uh, uh, interferes with enough with their ability to make uh, vitamin D in the skin. So supplements or fortified foods are important. That's why we started adding vitamin D milk long long time ago. We had vitamin D to milk because Vitamin D deficiency can be a problem. Okay, so um, so here's some food sources, but uh, you know, and begging the question. So because we make it from the sun, should you allow your children to sunbathe? The answer is no. However, 
Um, sun, ex sun exposure, hands and face, walking around outside is appropriate, especially after the age of six months. Okay, sugar. I have a lot of text here, but I thought I'd hit the highlights for you. No sugar at all to the children under the age of two years. You know why already? We've talked about it. American Heart Association is adamant about this because of taste preferences and risk for obesity and so forth. And the thing is, there's not room in their diets for junk food. They're growing a brain. If you think about kids, they're growing brains and muscles. The first few months, they're basically growing a brain and just getting started on the little tiny muscles. And then in the, in the next few months, they're, they're developing more and more musculature and more and more cognitive function. And so you want to grow the brain. Sugar is not going to do any of that. And if sugar displaces healthful foods, then we're not, we're not helping to meet their needs. And we may increase the risk for obesity and the taste preference issue. Now, older kids, the cutoff is, is six teaspoons per day. Please do not interpret this as a goal. This is not a DRI. This is an upper limit that's unofficial. It's an upper limit and none is better. There's no reason to include sugar except it's fun. And, but I am also, and I'll get into this with responsive feeding, all foods in moderation, because if you try to be super restrict, restrictive with kids and go, you know, after age two, no, you can never have sugar. They're gonna go over to the neighborhood kid's house and eat all the Captain Crunch or whatever it is, because they're gonna go, it's crap, right? And like, whoa, who knew? And so, you know, there's moderation and, and there's ways to do this with families where you have um, yeah, treat night. You know, say so you have older kids, Every Friday night, we have ice cream and watch a movie. You know, and we have dessert on Wednesdays or something like this. You have treats. They're called treats. They're part of your life, but they're not your daily thing. Now, I grew up in a, a generation where we had dessert almost every night. My mother made, you know, I'm not, she made blueberry cheesecake. Now it's kind of out of the box. Right? They had canned blueberries at the time. I'm just saying, jello. But um, and then they made, you know, she made cakes from scratch and pies and so, so we had dessert all the time, which I think did affect my taste preferences. And I like right now, I would like to go eat some of that pie. Just right. I don't, I don't crave shrimp. I crave my mother's pie. Um, so, but in our generation, we were a lot more active in our portion sizes or smaller. This is before the restaurants blew up and the portion sizes blew up and people ate out so much. And so during this time, Dessert work, you know, you can have some, and then, you know, we ran around all the time. And so we were able to, 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 to most of us get out of childhood without being obese. And now kids are indoors a lot and their portion sizes are bigger. And there's so many fast foods. You know, there, I think I had two cookies that were in a box when I was a kid. They're all wafers and graham crackers, which I still like. But look at what people have now. Look at the sugar cereals, look at all this kind of stuff. It's so easy to overdo the calories, overdo the sugar, and set the stage for a, a lifetime of being unhealthy. So, and we've already talked about this, it's bad for you. And then we, you guys know all this because you've had the introductory nutrition classes that sugar is not just sugar, it's corn syrup, honey, maple syrup, or none of this stuff's healthy. So, so this is the key thing, not at all under age two. And there's a, and why? And there's a cutoff for kids ages two to 18, but this is an upper limit. Chris and I will both be sad if you say that another way. Okay, question. Yeah. Um, I was just looking at this jar of baby food and I don't have kids, so I don't really know. I just have this from food science, but um, yeah. like total carbs, it says 21 grams and then it says 23% daily value. Is that their daily value or is it based on like the 2000 calories a day? No, it's gonna be, if it's a baby food, it's gonna be based on the daily value for that age group. Okay. Um, what's the what's product? Um, like this prune baby food. Okay, so the, uh, you know, I would look, now we have to put added sugars on the label. It hasn't been very long where we didn't have to do that. So added sugars help the, the I'm not ever worried about carbs ever, you know, mostly not worried about carbs um if they come from real food but it's the added sugars i were but having said that yeah i would make an exception for juice for example because the the bioavailability of the sugar is too high and people you know you know they they 
the blood sugar goes up too fast and stuff like that. But so does that have does that have ingredients on it? Yeah, it just says prune puree, which is water and prunes. Yeah. I would consider that a completely fine food for, for a baby food. Okay. And uh, oh, there's one caveat. If you've ever had a child um, or taken care of a child, um, be careful how much prunes you give them. Now, a lot of kids don't have this problem to, a lot of kids are okay with their bowel movements until they start eating complimentary foods. And then sometimes they start eating those complimentary foods and they plug up. And so then parents, they just stop pooping and then, then the kids are crazy. They hurt, they're uncomfortable. Parents are doing anything they can. They call a pediatrician. It takes a while, the kid's not drinking enough water. There's so many ways to get around this or that this can happen. But um, so then they'll go to, to prune, prune puree. All I will say is moderation in all things. You, you want to alleviate the constipation, but not start a freight train. <laughs> okay, so anyway, but it's a good product. Prunes have a component in them that is actually stimulates uh, lactation. So everybody knows that. But that's why uh, in the cafeterias, they always have prunes for older adults. Okay, um, fats. Overall, we don't put kids in a low fat diet. Remember, breast milk is close to 50% calories from fat. How many is close to be? You're used to consuming a lot of fat. I'm going to say something about adult foods too. Low, when we went to the, it was in the 80s, we went to this low fat phase. I don't know, you guys weren't born then, but foods, you know, what happened around that time is several companies like Snackwells and organizations like that came up with products thinking, oh, this will work. Uh, here's cookies that are fat free. Y'all remember any of this? You know, this stuff. So, these snack well chocolate chip cookies and they're fat free. And everybody thought, oh, cool, I can just eat all of them. And then America got fatter <laughs> and people got fatter. And one of the reasons it is because there's not much satiety in those only sugar, low fat products. And the, the caloric density was really high. And so it's easy to eat a lot before you get full. And, and even then, you may not feel so good. So it doesn't really help with weight maintenance to eat low fat foods. As long as you're eating modern main food. But if, look, look at the nice fatty foods I have here. Um, adding modern amounts of nuts and things to the diet for adults can really help with satiety and stop you from overeating. Even solid carb foods can cause people to be hungry in, in half an hour. So, so you don't want to get kids, if, you don't want to choose low fat foods, but you do want to think about what foods. Okay, so what foods? Well, saturated fat, you have know, trash macaroni and cheese. I'm gonna to continue to do that. It's one of my pet peeves. Okay, saturated fat should be lower than 10% of calories. The law kids eat a lot of saturated fat. They get it in cheese, whole milk, and so on. And I'll talk about milk later, but it's easy to get too much. We also need our essential fatty acids. And this is a time where essential fatty acids should be an important part of your diet from this day forward. So I talk about the details of these fatty acids more in the pregnancy lecture. Lecture. I'll give you a little review of this, but just for now, remember omega-6 fats, the shortest chain one is linoleic acid. And this is found in basically all of your vegetable oils, with the exception, there's not much in olive oil, but just about everything else. So any fried food, any salad dressings, any items maybe whole, you know, whole wheat, linoleic is the linoleic acid is a nut. So it's, we all get enough pretty much. Most people do. Omega-3 fats are a little hard to get at. And that's because look at the food source. Okay, so the, the shortest chain omega-3 fat, and I'll ask you this now and then also when we get to the pregnancy lecture because um, essential fatty acids really matter in development. So just getting started right here. So the shortest chain omega-3 fatty acid is alpha linolenic acid. Look at the difference in the spelling. Omega-6 linoleic and alpha linolenic, there's just an M added there, right? So get those spellings straight. The, when I talk about shortest chain, 
What I mean is you can get these easily from many, many pieces in a diet, but sometimes you can consume longer chain fatty acids or our bodies, which I will go over, can convert the short chain fatty acids to long chain. So for example, if you only consumed oil that had linoleic acid, your body can convert it to arachidonic acid, which is an important uh, body nutrient, okay? So bottom line here, omega-6 fats are easy to get. Most Americans get enough. Omega-3 fats are harder to get in the diet. If you look at the foods there, I mean, he's, you know, hippies are eating ground flax seeds, but not everybody may be feeding their kid ground flax seeds. They may be using canola or soybean oil. You know, I, I'll say this, but if you saute a lot, you may just use olive, olive oil. So it just depends on, on the foods here, right? So there may or may not be good sources of omega-3 fats from natural foods or from minimally processed foods. DHA is highlighted because this is a longer chain omega-3 fat. We can either eat it or make it in the body. We're not all that good at synthesizing it. So it's good to consume it. Look at the food sources here. Unless someone is eating specifically for DHA, they could easily be missing out on, on giving enough DHA in your diet. You may have seen these, but the, the way they get DHA into eggs, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but they actually feed the chickens either fish meal or more commonly, uh, uh, there's a certain type of algae that makes DHA, it's the cosahexaenoic acid. There's a certain type of al uh, uh, algae, algae that makes it. And so they can actually feed the algae to the chicken and the chicken has the eggs and it's got DHA in it. So they're able to, we're able to get eggs with DHA in it from how we feed the chickens. And um, I don't have a picture here, but there's some of the milk products are fortified with DHA. Horizons is an example. It's expensive, $5 half gallon, something like that. Um, and then, of course, salmon, light tuna, you don't want to feed albacore tuna, which we'll talk about later, but it's high in mercury. But so, but light tuna, sardines are good. Not many people eat them, but they're a very healthy source of omega-3s and then some fortified products. So in summary, to get at omega-3 fats, parents need education. Not everybody's going to be eating these items. I know I've probably talked a little too long for your attention span. So wake up, get up, jump around by. Do you have any questions before we end today? Okay, thank you. Remember you have work to do today. And also if you're having co-author problems, be sure you get to me. And uh, I have posted the lecture from last time. I posted it earlier, so it's available, the recording. And so as soon as this one gets done, I'll post it as well. In the meantime, be working on your study guides. You have a test coming up next week.